Welcome to lecture number four in the course Hybrid Electric Powertrains that deals with modeling, control and optimization and is uh, performed under the umbrella of the Swedish Electromobility Center. Now we will go into the optimal control and especially deterministic dynamic programming and give a few examples plus some additional analysis. The first part will be a bit of repetition. Now we'll come in and analyze the hybrid electric vehicles that we worked with last lecture, especially in terms of how much energy can be recovered, both what can be done in theory and what can be done in practice. I've seen this quite often now, and we're using this in the demand-driven analysis to see how much energy is required from a cycle. And you have started working with the exercises where you're starting to calculate these numbers for the different cycles to see how much energy we consume in air drag, rolling resistance and kinetic energy and also how to get to this simple equation for the energy utilization over a cycle. Last lecture went into the hybrid electric vehicles. We looked at a parallel hybrid electric vehicle where we have two parallel paths. We have one from the fuel tank through the engine out to the wheels and then we have one from the battery through the electric machine and out to the wheels and the electric machine enables recovery so we can recuperate some of the kinetic energy that we have used and in this case the engine rotation is coupled to the road through the gearbox so when we use the engine it must rotate synchronously with the wheels with the gear ratio of the gearbox in between as the ratio Coming to the serial hybrid or a series hybrid, we have everything connected in a series. So we have the fuel tank going to the engine, going to the generator, and the generator pushes electricity into the power electronics that can select whether we should store the electrical energy in the battery or if we should use it out to the wheels. And in this case, the engine rotation is decoupled through this power electronic. So we can select the engine rotation freely and we can place it at the most favorable load point and the most favorable speed point. And we can also select to stop it. So we can use it only for a short period at its most efficient point and generate more power than we need for the propulsion so that we can charge the battery so that we later can drive the vehicle on that energy that we have provided. In the modeling we focused on the topic of this course and that is to describe the energy transfers or powers in the vehicles and the losses that we have in the components. So we use efficiencies of the components and here we have two figures that I showed. One is for a combustion engine map where we are plotting it in the specific fuel consumption. This specific fuel consumption is proportional to one over the efficiency. Here we see the most efficient region of this particular engine and here we could see that if we would place it in this speed range and in this load range we would be generating energy with the least amount of fuel in relation to how much energy we are taking out. And on the other side here we have the electric machine map. So an electric motor that operates in motor mode and that operates in generator mode. In the modeling we can utilize scalable models, for example Willans approach where we are modeling the losses and we're modeling the theoretical efficiency of the device. When we are going to implement and use these models we have to consider that the implementations respect the component boundaries, for example the engine should be operating from idle speed up to its maximum speed and we cannot take more torque out of it than its maximum torque. The same thing for the electric machine. We're not allowed to take out more torque than the machine can deliver and we're not allowed to take out more power than the machine can deliver. And the same thing for the braking. As well as we may not overspeed the electric machine either. So this is an important part in the um, implementations that you mind these boundary conditions. And if you evaluate the trajectory that goes outside this boundary, you have to say that it's not allowed, for example, by providing infinite cost. In the hybrid electric vehicle and also in the all-electric vehicle, the battery is a key component. And here you see an example 
of two batteries that have been discharged at three different currents. And here we're looking at the ampere hours out of them and they are all been normalized to the total capacity of the battery. And we see different cell chemistries have different characteristics. And in this case, it's the same cell chemistry, it's LFP chemistries, but they have the same characteristics uh, essentially. From this experiment, we can extract the inner resistance that we have here, and we can also extract the capacity because we see how much current we have taken out before the voltage starts to drop. Other issues related to batteries are the state of charge estimation. This is something that we need to work with in practice to keep track of what's the state of charge and what is the remaining range that we have in an all-electric vehicle. In a hybrid we have to keep track of the state of charge for the driving when we make the selection whether we should use the electric machine or the combustion engine. In a real product it's also important to monitor the state of health. Then we monitor how many cycles we're using the current and the voltage and the temperature that is stressing the battery. To prolong the life of the battery, then it's important to have temperature monitoring. It's important to monitor the currents and also to keep the sock in its most desirable range. Motivated by that fact that we have fairly flat characteristics here in the interior of the battery operation, we are saying that the open circuit voltage does not depend very much on the state of charge. So when we come to the model for the battery, then we will use this model where we have an open circuit voltage, which is the voltage we get out on the terminals if we don't have any load or if we don't charge the battery. So in this course we say that this one is constant and then we model the resistive losses in the battery so that the output voltage becomes like this. And then we also model the state of charge by keeping track of how many charges have we taken out from the battery. When we talk about the current, we often talk about the C rate and we're comparing how fast the battery or the pack is charged in related to its capacity. So C1 means full capacity in one hour. And to protect the battery, we need to impose limits on the current. That is what you will do. You will also monitor the state of charge so that you're not going too deep down and also avoid overfilling the battery in case if we have a regenerative braking or we are charging it from the engine. Next week I will make a separate lecture on batteries so stay tuned. You have also looked at the inverse thinking in terms of the modeling which was hopefully an eye-opener for you where you work with the driving cycle and then you can go through the vehicle and see what did this driving profile require in terms of fuel from the particular vehicle that we have modeled. This gives very efficient computations and it gives exact cycle following. This is good if we want to do optimization or sensitivity studies for example if we want to see if I change this parameter what will be the change in the fuel economy. Now we will connect the analysis that we have done to the hybrid electric vehicle and look at the what we can do with a hybrid electric vehicle in terms of improving the fuel economy, especially with respect to the regenerative braking. Previously we considered only the energy demand from the cycle, but the cycle can give energy back to the vehicle. So we can utilize, for example, the brakings here and regenerate that energy and store it in the battery for later usage. The opportunity that we have here now in hybrids is to do this energy recovery while we are driving. If we have perfect recuperation that means that the acceleration that is built up of kinetic energy is completely recovered so that as you remembered previously we had a third component here which was the mass action related to the acceleration. That term is now gone and those of you who summed over all accelerations and did not go into the traction condition noticed that the sum became equal to zero because we have equal amounts of acceleration and equal amounts of decelerations. Since we now are looking at the total energy consumption and we consider the kinetic energy to be removed, then we just have to sum over the entire cycle because we have to 
overcome all the air drag losses and all the rolling resistance losses because the kinetic energy that could be utilized previously is gone into the battery. If we look at perfect recuperation and calculate the numerical values, we get the following for the rolling resistance and that is essential that we have to account for the full distance of rolling and for the air drag we get these elements. And we can put down this equation where we have the mass and we have the cross section area. Without recuperation we have these numbers that you might remember from previously. And with perfect recuperation we get these numbers that mass effect related to acceleration is gone while the rolling resistance in this case is taking the full area. In the previous case with the conventional vehicle we couldn't do regenerative braking but we could utilize the energy during the decelerations to overcome a bit of the rolling. So these are smaller here and the same thing goes for the air drag. A little bit of the air drag be overcome the kinetic energy that we had stored but that kinetic energy is placed in here so we get an improvement by doing this. So if we look at perfect recuperation and no recuperation for two different vehicles we get the following. So this is for a full size vehicle and we have no recuperation here so in this case we have all the energy that we have from the kinetic energy up here and then the air drag increases a little bit because we cannot utilize the kinetic energy to roll out and the rolling resistance term also increases a little bit. But still we have this gain in terms of fuel economy for doing energy recovery. And for a lightweight vehicle we have the same things, less mass, so the losses are less in a smaller vehicle, but we still have the gain here from the energy recovery. Now let us consider vehicle design and we're posing the question how much would a 10% change in the cross section area or a 10% change in the rolling resistance or a 10% change in the mass change the fuel economy. So we're interested in how much bang for the bucks do we get by making investments in the development of vehicles in the three different areas. For example this is designing the vehicle making it smaller so that it gets smaller cross section area and making it more efficient in terms of the drag coefficient. And this is to use better tires and this is to use more lightweight materials or taking other paths to lightweight. When we do a sensitivity analysis the P here is either one of these three. We change the, this parameter from a nominal value with a change and then we can see how much change we get in terms of the energy change and we can nor we normalize it with the nominal value that we had before the change. So here is a relative measure and we're also doing a relative measure of the parameter. Another way of looking at this like to putting it like this and this then becomes the derivative of the function with respect to this parameter around the point P. And then we do a scaling here with the parameter size and the total energy size. So this becomes a relative measure of how important a certain parameter is for the end function. And when we look at sensitivity analysis with respect to these design parameters for the energy over the European cycle, we get the following. Here we have the full size vehicle and here we have the small size vehicle and we see here that for the full size vehicle and for the small size vehicle the vehicle mass, this one and this one, is the most important parameter for improving the fuel economy. And also the other way around it's if we add mass that is bad for the fuel economy. The sensitivity is about twice for the mass versus the rolling resistance or the air drag. And for a lightweight vehicle the main message is that mass is important for fuel economy and that's why there has been such a big development in using lightweight materials and getting access to more efficient vehicles. Then when we look at the energy consumption of the cycle as function of mass. So if we have zero mass but we have the air drag fixed and so on then we start here and then when we increase the mass we go up. If we would have perfect energy recovery the 
increase here would be in terms of the rolling resistance because that's influenced by the mass. We consider here that we have the same frontal area all the time but you can see here that we have this quadratic behavior in the force requirement when we go up to higher speeds. So from 50 to 80 is 30 kilometers an hour and from 80 to 120 is 40 kilometers an hour but the distance here is not 4 over 3 compared to that one it, but it's what we're seeing is the air drag. If we cannot recuperate then we will lose more with a heavier vehicle because we are losing more to the accelerations but if we would be able to recuperate completely then we get a value here that is fairly similar to having a constant speed of the vehicle over the same distance. And the gap here increases with increasing mass due to the lost kinetic energy. This is now perfect recuperation devices and this is a non-existing recuperation device. But when we look at the theory, so this is the nominal point. So if we would just be able to magically put a recuperation device on it that be able to recover all the energy, then we would end up down here. So this is improvement in theory. In theory we could save 24% if we had an ideal recovery device. But when we add a recovery device we will add weight because we need a battery that's bigger than the normal battery. We need an electric machine to take up it as generator and we also need to use the electricity to propel the vehicle later. So we need the electric machine and we also need power electronics to connect them to each other. So we are adding mass to the vehicle and for realistic recuperation devices we would end up in 200 kilograms of the battery pack of the electric machine and power electronics to be able to utilize the energy for later accelerations. The recovery devices are not perfect either so we have some losses even though that electrical components are fairly efficient we will have a little bit of loss and we have the round trip efficiency that is during the regenerative braking we are putting energy into the battery and then during the acceleration we're taking energy out of the battery. That will cause a little bit of losses due to the resistive losses and due to the losses in the electric machine and the power electronics. So a reasonable efficiency of that is about 80% of a round trip efficiency. And then we are here, so a realistic improvement in fuel economy by using regenerative braking is about 15%, which is good and it's well worth managing. At this time, I think it's good to take a short break before we go into optimization and optimal control. So take a break, get up and get some blood circulation into your body and come back later to watch the coming video.